Right. Now, if you'd like to take your new sheet, you'll find inside, I hope, there should be a, uh, an outline for the small... There is no new sheet. All right. In that case, find another piece of scrap of paper and you can write down what you're going to see on the screen uh, today. And it's all about why Jesus came. Why Jesus arrived. Our theme for all of Christmas this year has been the arrival of Jesus Christ. Now, I was uh, travelling over, over Christmas and going up the motorway, and there was one, one period of time in, on the motorway where the traffic was very light, and I was in, in lane one, I put the cruise control on, I was just pootling along at 70 miles an hour. Not a care in the world. When all of a sudden, a BMW came up behind me and shot past me in the outside lane. He must have been doing... Uh, phew, 95, 100, 105, I don't know. He went past at a furious pace. Now, why was he travelling so fast? There are two ways of understanding that question. First of all, I could understand it from the cause and effect point of view. Why is he travelling that fast? Well, he's got his foot down and he's got a big engine underneath that bonnet. Hence, the velocity of the car was about 100 miles an hour. The other thing you need to know is he had blue flashing lights on the top. <laughs> so then I could ask the ground consequent reason, uh, 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 question about why. Why is he going up the, uh, up the motorway so fast? There's something really urgent further up the road that he has to attend to. So there's both reasons why in terms of cause and effect... That's the scientific, the physical, the natural reason. And why in terms of ground and consequent, is there something very important that's going on? We can ask the same about Christmas. The cause and effect reason for baby Jesus being born is that a woman was pregnant and she gave birth. A very common occurrence. The ground consequent reason, why did that happen, the deeper reason, is what the Bible goes into and in numerous places after the Gospels have told us the story. And that's what I wanted to do this morning, just to pick up on one of those places in the book of Hebrews. So maybe you'd like to take your Bible and turn to Hebrews. If you're using the church Bible, it's page 1202. Page 1202 or Hebrews chapter 2 if you're using your own uh, otherwise you'll have to boot it up on your phone or whatever and uh, you can follow the, the reading. Now I don't know what you thought about the reading earlier on. Did it sound a little bit obscure? Actually this is the writer to Hebrews. We're not quite sure who he was so we'll call him Hebrews for the sake of argument this morning. And the writer to the Hebrews saying that Jesus Christ is more important, more significant than angels and of Moses. Now, of course, Jewish people held angels in very high honour, so did they with Moses. And what Hebrews is arguing is that Jesus is greater than both of them. And in fact, if you read the whole sweep of the book, you'll pick up the argument very quickly. You see, when Jesus came, we're told in the Gospels that he arrived... As God made flesh, the word, God's word, became flesh. The same stuff that you and I are made of. And the rest of John's gospel, having said the word became flesh, it unpacks how Jesus showed himself to be the son of God in human form. And ultimately, how he died and, and rose again. So the baby in Bethlehem was born to die on the cross of Calvary. You cannot separate the cradle and the cross. They're both intimately linked with one another. So what I want to do is to take this passage in Hebrews 2, just unpack actually three reasons this morning. There are lots, but there are three particular ones that come out quite clearly here. About why Jesus came. Not the cause and effect reason, a little baby was born, but the ground and consequent reason. Actually, why did he come so far as we're concerned today. And the first thing I want you to notice is this. Look at verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 2. He was born to destroy Satan. Verse 14, since God's children have flesh and blood, he too shared their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. So actually, so far as Christmas is concerned, far from being 
a, a nice, sweet, cosy occasion, there's something intensely destructive about it. Let me, let me unpack that with a, a parallel example. Most of us have heard the story of David and Goliath. Da- little David, big Goliath. Little boy, five stones, shoots a stone at Goliath, the big enemy, hits him in the forehead and, and, and Goliath falls down. Now, what did David use to kill Goliath? If you ask that question of most kids outside in the Sunday school, they're going to say, well, he used a stone. Actually, if you look at the passage, you discover he didn't. The stone stunned Goliath and caused him to fall. But the instrument that actually killed him was Goliath's own sword. David took it from its scabbard and beheaded him. It was Goliath's... Nice, happy little story. Um, It was Goliath's own sword that caused his own death. Now, when Jesus went to the valley of death and destroyed Satan, as Hebrews is telling us here, he used Satan's own weapon, death itself. To be sure, Satan had the power of death, but death was never part of God's original created order. It came upon us because of our our wrongdoing, because of our diversion from God's plan for us. So by being born a man, by living, dying and rising again, Jesus took hold of Satan's chief weapon, death itself, and dealt death a deathly blow. 1 John chapter 3 verse 8, if you're making notes you might like to make a note of that reference. 1 John 3 verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And that's why we can say with such confidence, and Paul says this in in one of his letters, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O grave, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was born to destroy Satan and his power. Now, actually, the word that we have translated destroy is quite an interesting one if you look back in the original Greek. And it's a nuance that doesn't quite come through uh, in English. We think of destroy as to, to blow something up. If you've ever seen that, I think it's on the Quest channel, that program destroyed in seconds. It's a great program if you're into that sort of thing, where, where they show you examples of things that are just completely nuked in a matter of seconds. But that's not the original idea. The original idea was to, yes, to, to destroy in the sense of wipe it out. But the, the way it was destroyed was it by being dissolved, by being nullified. In fact, there's one version that translates this word as nullify. Uh, the, the, the word occurs elsewhere in the Bible as well. Uh, there was a time when St. Paul was in a, in a boat. He was travelling. The boat ran aground. And we read about how the sea battered this boat so much that it was completely rendered useless. It was reduced to smithereens. The idea that the ship was broken into a thousand pieces, it was fallen apart and it dissolved into the sea. That's the word that's used. And that's what happens to death as a consequence of the cross. Because Jesus came as a human being, the power of death has fallen apart. It's been dissolved. Furthermore, our, because of, of, of our blood relationship to Christ, in the sense that we're made of the same stuff, we share in his victory over death. That's what Hebrews is telling us. So, so the Christmas message, really, is this. Jesus was born as a human being, So that Satan and death could be rendered impotent, could be dissolved, made powerless. And for me that puts a a wonderful complexion on Christmas. And it's not one you find written up in the Christmas cards very often. But there it is. Jesus was born to destroy Satan. Not only that, I noticed that Jesus was born to defeat sin. You'll find that in verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 2, if you've got it there on your lap. For this reason, he had to be made 
a human being like his brothers, that's talking about Jesus Christ, <clears throat> in every way, in order that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. I don't know if any of you have read Ian McEwan's book called Atonement or seen the movie that came out a few years ago. Uh, it's a very interesting story because it's a story about a young girl called Bryony who saw something involving her older sister and wove a story around it that was completely different from reality. But that story that she wove around it and told other people had devastating consequences in the life of her sister. I won't tell you everything that happens because that will be a plot spoiler. It's a book <laughs> worth reading. Because it carries the idea of atonement all the way through. Bryony was racked with guilt. And actually she spent the rest of her life trying to atone, trying to make good for her wrongdoing. And that's the, the base level of the, of the concept of atonement. There is, however, one huge extra that Jesus Christ adds to this idea of atonement. Whereas in, in our common thinking, uh, when we atone for something, we try to make good by being good, that was the case in the, in the novel, we are atoning for our own wrongdoing. What Jesus does is he atones for somebody else's. That's a huge difference. Instead of Jesus Christ going through life trying to atone for his own sin, he came to the end of it and atoned for ours. That's what makes Christianity so very different, utterly and unique. My wrongdoing and yours can be forgiven because of the sacrifice of Christ. So he had to come as a baby in order that this could take place. And actually, when the, when the Christmas story uh, is, is first unfolds in the Gospel of Matthew, we're told about this. And, and when the baby is forecast, we're not told the one thing that we always want to know when a baby is, is about to arrive. And that's it, when it's going to be born. The first thing that comes to mind, the first thing that the angels told Mary, or asked Mary... Uh, said to her rather is this is what you're to call him you are to give him the name Jesus which means saviour because he will save his people from their sins now you know we we can get all gooey over a baby and conjure up the joy of new birth and that's fine so far as it goes but let's not dilute the fact that his coming into this world has to do with the sins of the world he arrived to do something about the corruption of humankind, which was his father's creation. Sin, wrongdoing, call it what you like, it creates a barrier between us and God. And we can't get through it by ourselves. It created estrangement between the creature and the creator. We, we were poles, poles apart. And that issue tugged at God's heart. He had to do something about it. And sending his son, coming himself in human form, is what he chose to do. There are two, two essential Bible words to, to understand uh, this, this process, to understand what God is doing. One has to do with the Godward side of it, and one has to do with the manward, our side of it. And so far as the Godward side is concerned, uh, there's the word propitiation. A bit of an unusual word for us to use uh, today, but it's there. You'll find it in 1 John uh, chapter 2. You might, you might write that down if you want to uh, find out where it is. You see, in the Old Testament, when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, uh, he had to have blood sprinkled on himself, and he in turn sprinkled this blood over the mercy seat. And that blood represented the cost of the wrongdoing of God's people. The mercy seat was the place where they, they understood God lived. And so they brought blood to indicate that someone had died on behalf of these sinners. Now what Hebrews tells us is that our high priest, Jesus Christ, has entered heaven in just the same way that the high, high priest entered the Holy of Holies. But instead of bearing the blood of some bull or other animal he carried his own 
And in doing this, the righteous demands of holiness were satisfied. And, and, and the wrath of God is taken away. Propitiation, as I say, not a word that we use very much in, in ordinary conversation. But uh, propitiation carries the idea of bearing God's wrath away. So that if I was to bump into him tomorrow, if I disappeared from this life tomorrow, I would not have to face him as a God who potentially could judge me. I'd face him as a God who loves me and who gave himself for me because his wrath has been carried away. That's the Godward side. Now the, the sort of human side, the manward side, has to do with this, this word, which we do use a bit more today, although again not very often. It's the, it's the idea of reconciliation, of bringing two parties together. I've given you a reference there, 2 Corinthians 5.19, you might like to look it up afterwards. It says this, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. Actually, reconciliation is a very 21st century word. Because we live in a world that is, is full of enemies. There's still a war going on in Afghanistan. There are huge cultural tensions in part of our own nation. I'm so glad that we were able to pray for them earlier on. There are marriages where husband and wife are tense with each other. Where they are enemies. And the baby at Bethlehem was born so that reconciliation could be found at the very deepest level of the human soul at the spiritual level reconciliation between God and man implicit in the Christian message is the truth that in Jesus we and God are no longer sworn enemies I just find that stunning no longer is God my enemy he is now my friend no longer is he my judge he's now my saviour Jesus was born to defeat sin and then the third and final reason he was born to deliver people Let's have a look at uh, verse, verses 14 and 15. Again, in Hebrews chapter 2, you'll have it there on your lap if it's still open. Since God's children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that he might free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. You know, without having Christ in our lives death is a fearful thing I had a boss um, some years ago before I went into the ministry I had a boss who was scared stiff of death and he would often tell me so and then one day his brother died and, and, and he realised the closeness of death how thin a thread our lives hang on and when I went to see, just to express my sympathy for him, he was visibly shaking. We often use the word devastated in a rather loose way. We see people on television interviewed about some tragedy, oh, I'm devastated, but they don't show it in their actions. Now, this man did. He was devastated by his, bro his brother's death. And, and God gave me the opportunity just to share one or two bits with him. He didn't wasn't particularly able to receive it at the time but I hope he knew that he had some people me and Rosie in particular who were concerned about him that's about as much as we could convey at the time Woody Allen once said I don't mind the thought of death I just don't want to be around when it happens <laughs> when however we trust in Christ Death ceases to be the end. It's been dissolved. Its power has been nullified. That's why at funerals, although terribly sad, where, where intense grieving comes to the surface so often, 
but funerals can be shot through with a ray of hope. Um, when I or one of our staff, when we do a funeral, there's, there's always a moment of committal where we commit the body either to be burned in the crematorium or to go down into the, the hole uh, at the graveside. And it's always a nasty moment. It's never something that we look forward to. But the words we, that, certainly that I use run like this. We commit his body to be burned, dust to dust and ash to, ashes to ashes and so on. But we leave his soul with God his maker. At that moment we can express huge hope because we can draw a distinction between the physical bit that has perhaps worn out because it's been on the, on the earth for 90 some years and the spiritual part which will continue. And God is a just God. And I believe that if there was the tiniest glimmer of faith in someone's life, however it was expressed, God will find it and deal fairly with them. Funerals can be shot through with hope because of what Christ did when he came. Because the baby arrived in Bethlehem and the cross happened at Calvary and the resurrection took place somewhere near Jerusalem, because of those events, we can look even at a funeral with great hope. Because in, those, uh, in that whole process, three things have happened. And with this we're going to finish. First of all, Christ has forgiven us from the penalty of our sin. There's an old hymn that we used to sing at Easter a lot. I haven't sung it for years now, but it has a verse that runs like this. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven. And let us in. He being Christ. That's why the truth about the virgin birth is so important. Just by virtue of, of being born a human, we're born sinful. Sin is not just what we do, it's the people we are inside. And we're all like it, me included, all of us here. Many of you will know, because I know you've put comments kindly up on our, on our Facebook page, that we've, uh, we've got a granddaughter. She's wonderful. I'm biased. She was a miracle. I'm amazed. And at the moment, she's a happy, contented little baby who eats her food, plays with her toys, and brings Chris and Polly a huge amount of joy. There will come a time when she will be defiant and will discover the true meaning of the word no. <laughs> and will Chris and Polly have to teach that to her? No, they won't. There's something innate in her that actually is defiant. And there's something innate in all of us that wants to defy God and go our own way. This is what Jesus Christ came to deal with. He forgave us from the penalty of our sin. Not only that, but he came to free us from the power of that sin. Verse 18 in Hebrews 2, you might like to look at it. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. We are all aware of the power of temptation and the power of wrongdoing. And what this, this scripture is telling us, as with many others in the Bible, is that Jesus identifies with us at moments of intense temptation. In the uh, Roman Empire in the first century... There were certain people who were given the task of caring for those who had no civil rights and were disowned by the, uh, by the Roman authorities. The sort of first century social workers. They actually were called succorers. Not suckers, succorers. <laughs> they were to bring succor to people. They were to come alongside to help. And what this passage is telling us is that Jesus Christ comes alongside to help even in moments of the most intense temptation because he too has been tempted just like we are actually there's a, a, a lovely word that's used of, of the Holy Spirit of Christ's Spirit with us now in, uh, in John's Gospel he's described as the paraclete Greek word comes from two bits para meaning alongside and well clete is a, is, comes from the verb kalio to call so basically, Christ has been called alongside 
to walk with us in life's journey. As we trust him, we discover that he's alongside us in the hassles that we face, in the choices that we have to make, in the parenting that we do, in the difficult decisions that come our way, as well as the huge joys that God throws in our lap sometimes. He is the paraclete, the one called alongside. And as he's called alongside, he is able to free us from the power of sin. Sin need no longer have its stranglehold over us because Christ is with us. And this is, this is the meaning of Christmas. Jesus was born to destroy Satan and to deliver people from the power of sin. So whereas in the past there will be a moment when he forgave us from sin's penalty, in the present he's, he frees us from the power of sin, and in the future he will deliver us from the presence of sin. It won't even bother us once we, we have passed through this life and meet him face to face. That's why we should come and worship the baby who was born so long ago. And I for one just want to bring my very best for him. In all sorts of ways. I wish you could have been here at about 8 o'clock this morning, when I was. And I heard the musicians practicing. And the guys up on the PA desk getting things right. Because we want to bring the best to the Lord. And when you look around the church, even you, see, you see the chairs laid out as they are. They are. Kevin did that. Because I know he wants to bring the best. And I've just chosen a couple of examples. You look round our church with all the people who serve out in the Sunday school, for example, and in our small groups. And all sorts of other places. We want to bring the very best to the Lord. Because he's brought the very best for us. In the past, we've been forgiven from the penalty of sin. In the present, we've been delivered from the power of sin. In the future, we will be delivered from the presence of sin. That's what Christmas is all about. That's what he came to do. That's why the baby arrived. Is it any wonder that when the angels appeared to the shepherds, they said, listen, behold, if you want the old man. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. That's what Christmas is about. Let's bow our heads in.